I'm excited to talk about a little bit of theory work um, that on uh, evaluating models that generate examples. And so how do we have loss functions that evaluate those? Um, it's uh, not right uh, dead on the theme of the workshop, but I think there are a lot of connections. I'm going to try to emphasize you know, connections and hope to spark a little bit of discussion. Um, so spend relatively less time on technical stuff and more on themes for the workshop that I hope uh, you'll find interesting. And please uh, do interrupt and ask questions or make comments. Uh, you can throw things, whatever uh, comes to mind. Um, sounds good. So uh, the, I want to talk about motivation for studying how do we evaluate models that generate samples. So how do we measure how good they are? Um, because I think it's super important in the context of foundation models and large language models. Uh, so you can ask this question, how good are large language models? Uh, and I think the answer is nobody knows. Um, and what's even stranger is you can even find very confident disagreement among experts on how good they are. And you see this um, come up in all these kinds of uh, examples where you see examples of these models doing really cool and really exciting things, and then you see examples of them like falling over in extremely stupid ways at the same time. So it's really hard to tell how good they are. Um, and to me, this suggests this mental model that these things, um, rather than being something that we've sort of built and engineered to solve tasks well, they're kind of like these alien creatures that just landed here, and now we have to figure out how they work. Um, so whenever I read headlines now, I kind of tend to substitute in um, an alternate view of what these things are like. So I just imagine you know, the deep sea octopoid that Google discovered and now figured out how to like, help you write your emails and you know, cheat on your homework and whatever. And actually, like, it works in the headlines really well, um, surprisingly, scarily well. Um, yeah, really, really well. Um, Octopoid makes school teachers obsolete. All of these were generated with mid-journey, um, all of these images. So um, we don't understand how, how good they are. We don't understand how well they're doing. And maybe that's fine if you're just trying to play around and have fun. But if you think about it as engineering to solve a problem, then uh, that could be a problem, right? So you see one headline where a bridge built by OpenAI does all these amazing things and supports um, you know, a whole herd of elephants. And then the next day, you find out that the same bridge collapsed because someone stood on it and did this. <laughs> and this is basically what hap what's happening with large language models, right? So OK, so this is, that's my view of it. Um, I'm maybe somewhat cynical, but I think there are also problems where there aren't a good incentives for rigorous evaluation. Um, in research, we get rewarded for like building new cool things that accomplish something new, or like we can demonstrate the possibility of accomplishing something new, but not necessarily reliability. Um, the industry incentives are maybe even more farther away from uh, investigating reliability. But I think there can be a lot of benefits to research on how do you rigorously evaluate. And it's a super, super hard problem, of course. But if we can improve, um, we can get a better understanding of what these things are good at and what they're bad at. And you would hope that um, that, that would lead toward progress in improving the weaknesses. Uh, and I think, uh, for example, if you think about supervised machine learning, so like labeling images, right? The fact that we had uh, benchmark data sets and we had loss functions and a lot of study about evaluation really led to a ton of progress, or at least it was a big component in the progress. Um, and if you have a good evaluation method, that can be a good training method, right? Because you just uh, make steps toward being better on the evaluation and your model improves. And that's basically how supervised machine learning works. And even in these unsupervised, like large language models, um, I'll talk a bit about how you know, we're still using these ideas of um, evaluating your loss and taking a gradient step and getting better. So, okay. Uh, also, I think if we had a better rigorous uh, understanding of how good and not good these models are at different tasks, we could be um, better at being sort of uh, honest and, and transparent with how these things should be used, and I think that would be a good thing. But okay, so anyway. That's the like spark discussion part. Um, 
So, well, okay, I should probably pause. Well, let me say what I'm gonna say next and then pause for comments or questions. So I'm gonna tell you about um, a research paper that we wrote this year uh, that solved all of these problems. <laughs> okay, no. Um, so we take this, the easiest version and I'll explain like why, what makes it easy and we bite off a very small chunk of the easiest version and we define some things and that's basically, it's a theory paper, so that's, that's basically it. Um, Okay, so any, any questions so far? Also, if we get started, it might run down so we can save them for the end as well. Okay, okay. So this is the uh, paper, Proper Losses for Discrete Generative Models, um, published this year with other researchers at Colorado. Um, okay, I was asked uh, what a discrete generative model is, and I guess I should say that. So we're aiming this at um, models that uh, represent a probability distribution, and when you query the model, it generates a sample or an example. Um, so we were originally thinking about GANs, which were used to generate things like you press the button and it generates an image of a face or it, something like that. Uh, it applies, you, you could argue that's what foundation models are doing as well, albeit with a context, right? So you give it some context or prefix and then it generates an example from the distribution of things that could follow that prefix. Uh, but this work is not going to apply as well to that kind of setting. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. The word discrete just meaning um, it's going to be better for things that can be represented, uh, well, on computers in uh, uh, discrete bits rather than over continuous spaces. Uh, right. So for example, thinking of an image not as a bunch of real numbers but as a bunch of pixels, and we'll see that the high dimensionality is a problem. Uh, okay, and actually, our motiva we're motivated by generative, generative models in forecasting problems. And so that's why I said the um, relationship to a lot of themes up here. Well, I think this is a good theme for this, this workshop, even if um, it's not in the headline. So people are doing this, right? So for weather forecasting, what they do is they build models that generate an example of how the future might go, and they use those models to try to forecast the future. And they're actually doing that in things like political elections too, probably also in sports. They're building a model that they think represents reality and then they're hitting the button and the model generates an example or a sample of how the future might happen. And they're using that to forecast the future. So we're interested in evaluating those kinds of models. And it's easier because later you get to see the future. Um, at that point it becomes the past and then you can evaluate the models on how close they were. So you have some ground truth there that makes this problem easy, a lot easier. Okay, so this is uh, summarizing what I just said. So typically the approach these um, researchers would take is try to build a model of the world that's as accurate as possible. For example, for weather forecasts and they use physics, but they might also bring in some deep learning. And then hit the button and generate examples and maybe a bunch of examples. And those constitute a forecast. So for example, they might say, um, you know, in 85% of the examples we generated, this candidate wins the election. Therefore, we're gonna forecast an 85% probability of them winning the election. So that's the kind of thing that they do. Um, okay, yeah, and so there's a well-defined goal here, which is also not necessarily the case with foundation models uh, typically. And here the goal is that the generative model should just match reality as closely as possible. So by definition, the optimal model is the one that generates from the same distribution that reality is drawing from. You know, it's assuming that you're sort of believe that the world works by generating random future paths from some distribution, or if you're Bayesian enough, then it might as well. Um, and you could also argue that um, things like GANs uh, are trying to achieve this task, generative adversarial networks. Really, they're just trying to match a given distribution as closely as possible. But I just want to caveat that I know a lot of foundation models aren't, this isn't necessarily a good description of what they're trying to do. Maybe you would argue it is, like there's some true distribution over, for example, um, paragraphs, and if you give it the first half of the paragraph, it should try to just match what reality would generate for the second. You could argue that's the correct task but you could also argue that's not the correct task. Um, in practice, as most of you know probably better than me, uh, foundation models tend to be trained with this sort of thing as an initial training step, right, where just try to predict the next token. 
but then they get improved with um, uh, like reinforcement learning from human feedback. So again, slightly different. Okay, I forgot what time I started, but uh, just let me know when to stop. We'll see. Okay, so background that, again, a lot of people know, but maybe not everyone. Traditionally, we evaluate predictions with uh, loss functions, and in particular, they should be proper. It's proper if the loss is a function of your prediction and then the observed outcome is minimized, the expected loss is minimized, by predicting the actually true distribution that reality is drawing from. So if you knew that, you would optimize your expected loss by just saying the correct true thing. You can't game the system um, by misreporting or by uh, optimizing to some incorrect prediction. Um, so I guess you know something is kind of important if a lot of different fields think that it's theirs. So this came out of weather forecasting in like the 1950s. Um, statisticians study proper losses a lot. Um, in game theory, this is related to truthfulness and truthfulness and mechanism design. Um, and then, of course, in machine learning and optimization, they try to study how do you design these things, especially for supervised learning, as I mentioned. So there's a lot of study about these. Um, and most of us know examples like the squared loss and the log loss. Uh, okay. So let's use those. Well, no, there's going to be a problem for, any, for many types of generative models. Uh, usually, or well, at least often, they're pretty black box. It's very hard to access internals of them. Um, and in particular, at least for this project, we wanted to study cases where we can't just query and ask the model, what probability do you assign to a given point? And if you can't query that, and like for example with GANs, which was one of our motivations, um, you can press a button and have it generate an example, but you can't say, what was the probability with which you generated this example? Um, and so calculating the loss is not possible because it just spits out examples, but it doesn't give you a distribution that you can write down and work with. And if it, if, if it did, which some generative models maybe can, so these, this might not apply, but it would also be super high dimensional and difficult to calculate with. So that's another problem. So we wanted to study, can you have good loss functions if the only interface to the model is to press the button and generate an example. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually confused about this. Uh, I, I feel like it might matter for what comes next. Yeah. Uh, one of the main reasons I want a loss function is to train the model properly. So, yes. So should I take you to be saying that none of what follows is going to particularly matter if we care about is training a model? Because in that case, you can see the probabilities. Um, so I guess it depends on what kind of model and training you're doing. Actually, what I'm hoping is if I can develop good losses, then we can use them to train the model. However, um, I'm claiming that in some cases with the way that generative models are trained are actually not with the kind of loss function that makes sense. That's what I would have thought you were saying. But in that yeah. case, I can look at the last layer of my LLM and see the distribution of the tokens. And yeah. you know, I've got this P, so it seems like a strange thing to be assuming that I can't look at that. Yeah, yeah, and that's probably because we started this project thinking about things like GANs where we don't, um, as I understand it, um, they're generally not made that way. Like they have an input of random noise, they process it, and an image comes out. And so we were thinking about this before we started thinking about LLMs. And whereas LLMs, as you said, actually tend to give you this distribution. And so, yeah, if you can, if you can use the proper loss, then uh, if you have the distribution, then you can apply the proper loss, and you don't need what I'm about to say, probably. Uh, yeah, I guess yeah. I'm wondering if what you had to say was going to have an interpretation of you know, still offering something on top of you know, plus entropy. Or yeah. Are you just entirely happy with plus entropy? Um, I'm, ha I'm pretty happy with it if I can, with cross entropy, if I can apply it. But I'm not a practitioner, so um, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. So I think this is interesting, but whether it applies is, is a question. Like, and then we'll get some more discussion at the end, uh, more so about LLMs and on the theme of the workshop. Uh, so yeah, we, just, we wanted to ask this theory question of what happens if you can only do hit a button, generate a sample. Um, so P is, let's say, the model that the learner is presenting you, and Q is the ground truth. You draw a sample from P, you draw a model from Q, and you compare them somehow, and you have a loss. Okay. 
that's, that's the idea. Okay. Um, and we said it's, this loss, we'll call it proper with a black box, if you minimize loss by choosing the correct ground truth model. Okay. Well, you can't do it. Um, actually, if you think about this, it's impossible because there's some particular sample that minimizes your loss. And the optimal thing for the generative model to do is to just produce that sample. You could think of this as mode collapse if you've seen it before. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit quickly, but um, that's a problem. But you can solve it because we can actually draw multiple IID samples from the generative model. So we can get a set of samples, and we can evaluate that set and ask if that collection of samples is a good forecast. So we don't have to just look at one. And so we can overcome an impossibility result. So we can draw n samples from the model. And then we get either one observation of the real world, or in some other settings, uh, you might get multiple observations from the real world that you can use to evaluate. OK, so uh, the main result of our paper is that you can do this if you draw more than one sample from the generative model. Uh, uh, and we can it's not super important. We can characterize how those proper losses look using basically polynomials and the theory of unbiased estimators. So a sort of polynomial in P of degree N can be unbiasedly estimated with N samples from P. And so you can use that to construct these black box proper losses. Uh, let's just think about really quickly what happens with squared loss. That's the key example. The naive thing you would try to do is take the empirical distributions and take the squared loss of your empirical distribution from the empirical ground truth distribution. This is not proper. Um, it's beneficial to extremize your predictions or do even like the mode collapse thing because the expected loss here actually has this variance term uh, in it. So the higher the variance of your prediction, the more penalty, penalized you get. But what's interesting, if you can draw multiple samples from P, you can correct for this. You can unbiasedly estimate the variance and just subtract it off. So you can correct for that. Um, and that's what this is. So that will give you a loss function um, that, OK, I'm skipping a term involving Q because it doesn't affect the incentives. But you can uh, actually get squared loss if you add this corrective term. Um, actually, and a funny bonus fact. You can actually also implement the log loss. You can get something whose expected loss is log loss. Um, if you draw your samples Poisson instead of drawing a fixed number of samples, and basically you can use the Taylor series for the logarithm to uh, unbiasedly estimate the log loss. Yeah. Hi, Bo. Sorry, I've gotten a little lost in your notation. So yes. yes. A and B are sets of examples. Yes. What's p hat and q hat? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. p hat is the empirical distribution of the samples A drawn from the model. And that's my fault, of course. q hat is the empirical distribution of samples B drawn from the ground truth. So you can take those two empirical distributions and just say, oh, let's just take the quadratic squared loss. It doesn't work. But uh, it does work if you take that squared loss and then add a corrective factor that sort of depends on the empirical. So now I have another question. So if, if yeah. in your setting A was a small cardinality like 2, yeah. and B is a small cardinality like 1, Could, yeah. and then this is a discrete space with maybe big, so like there may be, yeah. you know, a thousand points. Okay, yeah. so A is two different points. Yes. B is one other different point. Okay, so. This is, right, so, so yeah, that's my next slide. Okay. So, so this is proper. Okay, I need to I need to wrap up. So we'll get the, the next slide. So this is proper in expectation, but in high dimensional settings, it's totally impractical. Um, I mean, so even if you have a whole bunch of data, like yeah, a polynomial amount of data in an exponential size space is still not going to be successful in practice. Um, one reason this actually can be practical is you can do it on low dimensional features, so you can. Um, apply the loss on some feature of this high dimensional object that was generated and say, does this feature match the ground truths feature? Um, but actually, I think we just need more research to say, well, first of all, good impossibility results would be nice to know what we, we know some things are impossible here. But also more research would be nice or 
yeah, just deciding that we have to go beyond black boxes could be the way to go. OK, so let me put up a slide. Um, OK, I'll, I'll say these three types, and then I'll stop. So I think that breaking generative tasks down into types is going to be helpful for this. If you're forecasting, then there's a very well-defined task, and it's easy to evaluate relatively. Yet, of course, you run into all the issues that we just talked about. If you're doing a creative task, you just want to output pretty pictures. Um, I think we're doing really well with what we got. I think it's, I mean, there are copyright issues and plagiarism issues. But yeah, you just put in the word David Pennock into mid-journey, and it'll output this. <laughs> it's uh, amazing. Um, I don't ask me how, but it did. Uh, okay, but, but the main thing we want to do is like answer, solve problems. And I think there it's, it's very unclear because just predicting the next token well is not the same task as answering a question correctly. And we can try to use forecasting to train LLMs to answer questions, but it's just not clear if that's the right method for the task or not. Okay, so I went over. I think I have to stop. I'm not sure if there are time for questions, but thank you very much. <laughs>